I'm Gord Long with the Financial Repression Authority. I have Chris Casey of Windrock Wealth Management joining us uh, today. Uh, Chris has been with us before on a number of occasions. No stranger here. Welcome back, Chris. Thank you, Gordon. Happy to be here. Chris, last time we had you on, we were talking about the Austrian School of Economics and then before one of your papers on inflation. But uh, you've actually published a number of of papers that are at the on Mises Institute specifically. Do you want to just wrap to, uh, before we begin those uh, mention those papers? Sure. There's there's a number I have published there at the Mises Institute. They cover topics such as the wealth effect, inflation, uh, deflation, the trade off between uh, unemployment and inflation. Or I, a lot of these are dealing with common misconceptions within the economic arena, and it's equally all of these pretty much are equally applicable as it relates to oil. Well, that's it's a good lead-in, actually, because one of the misperceptions that's uh, false and I think held by the Fed is on cost push as regards inflation. Do you want to take us through that and where the and uh, where the misunderstanding is, at least from your perspective, and and the ramifications that it creates in the Federal Reserve poli policy setting? Sure. Well, the cost push push uh, theory of inflation is referred to, although maybe a lot of people haven't heard of it described as such, they've certainly heard of it in the mainstream media. You'll commonly hear things about the oil price is going up and therefore we're going to see a spike in the general price level. We're going to see inflation down the road. And this is actually a Keynesian concept that was developed uh, really in 1957, but it was, it was trotted out as an explanation as to why we had inflation in the 1970s. Because according to Keynesian economics, that was impossible to have inflation while you have a recession. And so the theory is, is that any particularly widespread and important commodity, like oil, if its price rises, it theref therefore raises the price level of all goods and services within an economy. And it sounds simple enough. It's very alluring in that sense, right? If oil goes up, we all know that gas prices go up and you pay more at the pump. And it sounds like the standard of living would go down and inflation creeps in. It was the mantra in the 70s, trust me, as I was standing at the oil pumps waiting to get gas. And inflation was a major problem until, uh, until Volcker fixed it at the end, of the end of the decade. But it was understood it was because oil prices were just pumping inflation into the economy, into, into a stagnation and with st uh, stagflation going on. Right. The problem with the theory, though, is that, to take the, the gas pump example, the more you're paying at the pump for gas, the less money you have to spend on other goods and services. And so maybe you'd go and buy that coffee while your gas is filling up the car. Well, now you can't buy it. That puts downward pressure on things like coffee or any other good and service. It decreases those prices. So in the end, the price level itself is largely unchanged because the price level is really just a function of the demand and supply of money itself not of any individual uh, commodity. And I think we've seen this over the last 15 years. So in, in reverse, Chris, today we have dramatic reductions at the price of gas at the pump. In New England, it was four fifty. Now I'm down below $2. Uh, but I don't see, uh, I don't see in, uh, deflation in, 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 in that regard. I don't see people spending more money even though that's a significant impact, I don't see the stores booming or any cha any change. And it used to be, um, the, the perception is minor shifts in the oil price had profound impact on the economy. Am I missing something there? Well, in the last 15 years, we've seen this repeatedly, right? Oil's gone from an 03, it went from about $25 up to about 140 in 2008, back down to around, I think it was around 30 in late 08. And now it, of course, went up to 140 just a couple of years ago. And Earlier this year, it was only in the mid-20s. So have we ever seen a price level that ro rose or decreased according to the level of oil prices over the last 15 years? The answer is no. The only well, pressure is your, is, is your blood pressure. <laughs> it goes up with your anxiety because it's so expensive. It's a far greater correlation. Now, the issue, though, is that the Federal Reserve does believe in this economic fallacy. Yeah, they, they do think that deflation could be caused by lower oil prices. So it's just one, it's the reverse of the cost push inflation theory. It's the cost push deflation theory. And we saw this as early as last summer. Fed officials were on record saying we're very concerned about deflation. So they're doubly wrong. One, they're wrong that deflation is a problem. Two, they're wrong that oil could actually cause it. And so I think the Federal Reserve, the great danger here 
is that they, in their mistaken belief that low oil prices could put a cap on any inflationary moves they do as far as printing money, that they could overshoot and cause even more inflation than they intend. Yeah, I think they're, they're, they are absolutely concerned about that because they're having a bear of a time achieving their inflation tar targets. How can so many smart economists, some of the absolute best in the world, be off track this significantly in something as really as common sense as this? Well, not only are they off track, but they seem to switch why they're off track every couple of years, right? I don't, growing up uh, and experiencing the 70s, at least as a child, I don't remember the Federal Reserve targeting a level of inflation. That's not their mandate. They shouldn't be picking a level of inflation arbitrarily, by the way. There's no reason 2% is a magic number. There's no reason it could be 1% or 3%. But why do they want inflation? If anything, they should be, they should be against it. And the... Unfortunately, not only are they ultimately the, the chief source of inflation, uh, but to actually promote it or think it's a good thing is just horrible. Well, I can answer that question, uh, Chris. It's because of something called financial repression. And you, you, sure. can't, you can't have it unless you have inflation. And why do you want inflation? The most fundamental reason is to be able to pay the debt of the country. Because let's never forget what the central bank's role is. It's to fund the government debt. And, and or make it fundable um, by the power. So lowering, falling interest rates or, or inf and having inflation is an effective way of debasing that, debasing the currency's purchasing power, uh, which makes their debt pay, uh, uh, e more manageable. It's that simple. I mean, it's a, it's a proven fact. So they're trapped in a box, aren't they? And even if they know it's wrong, it makes for good press, right? And, and easily justifiable a policy could be flawed. I don't mean to be cynical here, it's just that it's, I've talked to an awful lot of people and they all agree quite emphatically that I'm right on that. Do you agree with me? I agree. I mean, just look what would happen if you had a family in the United States that had hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt, but they had their own printing press. Of course, they're going to print money to pay for it. Um, inflation helps debtors, bottom line. And so, of course, they're going to pay for it. And they will pull out, just like they did in the 1970s, some boogeymen to blame for inflation when it does appear. And we saw this in the 70s with you know, the oil sheiks, the greedy, greedy businessmen. We'll see the exact same thing when inflation rears its head here. Now, how does this move to the economy from, from, from the regarding inflation, our cost push on inflation and energy? Yeah, well, you know, it's funny because I do remember the, the days when energy was lower energy prices were considered good for the economy. And I agree with that, all things being equal. I mean, if you look at economics in general, it's really the definition of it would be man's survival within the context of scarcity. So lower scarcity, all things being equal, is good. And I remember the days where we, they would discuss why lower oil prices were good for an economy. Unfortunately, they're not talking about that on CNBC anymore. They're talking about the increase in the junk bond yields because of uh, def defaults in the, the energy space. They're talking about people aren't spending money. Uh, that they've saved on oil, on uh, consumer goods to spur the economy, which was another economic fallacy. So I think lower oil prices, all things being equal, are good for an economy, but not for the reason that's commonly being cited on mainstream media outlets. I don't think if I talk to 100 people, 99 wouldn't tell me that it's good for the economy. Good, I, because they have more money <laughs> they're, it's the, to afford things, and it's got to be positive. Having said that, it's not having that impact because their debt levels, in my opinion, are so high it's going into helping service debt, they're having trouble servicing it. So it's not getting spent to the degree it could be or is perceived to be spent in consumption. It's just trying to absorb debt payments. Well, not only is it not, are we not recognizing any kind of benefit really from lower oil prices, but I think there's some real dangers that are out there that aren't being discussed by the mainstream media or economists nationwide. Uh, one of them is that I think there's the possibility that it could actually spike interest rates or at least mitigate a downfall in interest rates, all things being equal. Chris, you brought some, I, I think I got us off track a little bit, but um, it, you brought some slides with you in, in, uh, in regards to this discussion and energy. Do you want to take us through some of those? Sure. Well, let's talk first of all about what's happened in the oil markets because it's commonly cited that oil production has risen dramatically in the United States, and it has. It's increased about 
I think it's about 85% since 2008. That's incredible. It's a huge success story. What's not discussed, however, in anywhere that I've seen, is the decrease in oil imports by the United States in dollar terms. Actually, not just in dollar terms, but overall volume. Uh, if you look at oil imports by the United States, it's down from approximately 12% of total imports to less than 5% today. That's a huge swing of a major component of imports. Um, the price, as far as the dollar amounts of imports, are down about 60% in the last five years. Again, a dramatic move. And the reason I think this is important is that oil-producing nations are simply making less dollars from the U.S. customer. And the reason that's important is because any kind of oil uh, producer and seller gets dollars, and they only have a few choices what to do with those dollars. They can either hold on to them, they can buy U.S. goods and services, or they can buy U.S. capital goods, real estate, treasury bonds. And that's what's it's been going on for decades now, right? That's why you see the largest trading partners of the U.S., Japan and China, with massive U.S. treasury holdings. It's why a number of oil-producing countries, Russia, the Gulf states, etc., hold a massive amount of U.S. treasuries. And to the extent that they are simply receiving less U.S. dollars, they have less demand to buy U.S. capital goods, U.S. treasuries. And if that happens, and if because their economies come under greater stress, maybe they turn into net sellers, or at least reduce their purchases of treasuries. And that could, all things being equal, increase interest rates. Now, we may not see an actual increase in interest rates. Interest rates could very well decline. But the important fact is, if this plays out the way I just I just uh, discussed, interest rates would have fallen much farther, but for the selling or lack of demand from the oil producing countries. I think everything you're saying is actually happening, Chris, and exactly in that logic. I don't think there's any doubt about it. Another observation I'd make, and, and you make a very good uh, observation on the uh, lack or the slowing, dramatic slowing of imports of, of oil into the United States is something people aren't talking about. But another thing it's caused is a shortage of U.S. dollars around the world. Because instead of paying out with debt or U.S. dollars, we're not having to spend as much. It's not really showing up in our trade deficits to the degree you'd think it would. Uh, but there's less dollars out, so there's a real shortage of U.S. dollars. A lot of countries, um, they're, they're, they're are literally screaming about it, the problem it's, it's creating. It's one of the things that's contributed to pushing the U.S. dollar up uh, on the other side of it. But the, bigger, the biggest problem is these oil, OPEC countries have negative current accounts right now, huge current accounts, and they, uh, they have to sell. Um, you, they have to sell their, um, their bond holdings, their treasuries, to finance it or minimum. And they're under another point I'd make too, and I'd ask you to comment on it. A lot of these countries have their dollars, they have pegs, and their currency is pegged to the U.S. dollar. And they're having a bear of a time maintaining that peg. And if that peg breaks, a lot of things uh, come, in, come into play. We saw when, the Swiss, uh, when Switzerland broke its peg. But we see the Saudi real is under, under, I can go through the OPEC countries, the pressures they're under are maintaining the pegs. Comments on any of that? Saudi Arabia is probably the best example. Yeah. Um, they have the real pegged at the U.S. dollar about 3.75 reals to the U.S. dollar. And it's been like that way for as long as I can remember. Well, clearly, based on what's occurring, the U.S. or the Saudi Arabian economy is under strain. Their federal government, their government's under strain. I mean, they're at a point right now where their deficit last year was equal to 25% of their GDP. And that's staggering. Not, not debt, deficit. That's an equivalent to the U.S. of U.S. government having a deficit of, uh, let's say, five or six trillion. It's just, it's absolutely staggering. Um, so they are under a much, immense amount of stress. And any fixed exchange rate, the only way you can keep it at that level is through, uh, manipulation of the currency markets. The only way to do that is to be active buyers and sellers of reals or dollars to prop up your currency. And so, really what I think is just another reason, their budgetary stress, their desire to maintain a peg, although, uh, a fixed rate I should say, although they won't be able to, I think, for much longer, it's that desire which is helping them go bankrupt at an accelerating rate. And so, that could ultimately have an effect on U.S. interest rates as well. Well, Saudi, in the case of Saudi Arabia, that's one of the reasons they're uh, talking about floating an IPO with Saudi Aramco and taking it public. Uh, some percentage of it, I'm sure they'll maintain, I can't imagine they won't maintain control, 
but uh, turning over something under 50 percent. Otherwise, Russia and China would buy it immediately. But uh, but they're, they're, that's one of the ways of, of, of shoring up dollars. But if this oil uh, pressures continue, and that is the o I'll call it an oil glut, because that's what we have is overcapacity. And now we have Iran coming on board with three and a half million barrels a day, going as quickly as they can to five million. And remember, we're talking about a cultural clash here that's historical. Sunni versus Shiite, Persian versus Arab. That's that channel, the, sir, the Persian Gulf is is needed to separate uh, these countries. So that neither one are going to back off. And uh, so, you know, this, this is not an easy fix. And of course, Russia's got its problems being its major export is, is energy. And it's under, it's been under a lot of pressure. So there's going to be pressures to keep the oil, the supply up and, and, and pot maybe pushing prices down. Comments on that? I completely agree with you. I and mean, it is shocking that just a few years ago, we were talking about peak oil and now we're in this situation. Um, we should call it, I don't know if anyone's coined this term, but let's call it trough oil. And if, if it, no one's used that term before, let's copyright it and share any kind of licensing fees. But, um, you know, that, that is true. There's, there's significant supply uh, reasons why the price could fall from current levels. And I do think we're probably much closer to, to $20 than we are $100 in the near, short to near term. But the one item that we're not talking about, though, is the demand side of the equation. And... Yes, everyone knows what's coming online. Everyone knows about the supply situation. But if the world economies fall off significantly, we'll see that decrease in demand. And that's when the oil price could really fall out of bed. The, uh, but I do know this, that uh, when prices are falling like this, and then we see cutbacks, cutbacks in production at some point. But before you got, you get layoffs. You get rig counts starting to fall. There's a lot of capital that's not spent, not invested normal kind of process. So as when the prices get down, all of a sudden you'll have a heck of a spike back when the demand picks up in any marginal way because there's just not enough capacity suddenly. Everybody's been forced to cut it back. So it gets quite volatile. But, but uh, you know, that's that may not be in the short term because I haven't seen, I've seen a lot of pressures under debt, but I haven't seen the the layoffs and the downsizing quite yet. It's beginning. Clearly it's beginning now. I think we will see it fairly shortly. You're right. We, we've already discussed how the banks are, are writing off a lot of these as non-performing loans. We've seen the impact on the junk market where rates have spiked significantly. Uh, you can look at some things as, as rig counts, although it's difficult sometimes to interpret those exactly. Uh, we haven't seen the massive layoffs that you're discussing. But I think you're right. As the banking system continues to uh, constrain uh, the financing that these companies have, as far as the American uh, fracking companies, that's when we'll really start seeing some supply destruction, when you'll see uh, supply taken offline and the layoffs ensue as well. My sense is that the banks have held or are holding as long as they can with the expectations, at least it's been, that there's going to be a bounce and a rebound and, and we'll be back up to a more sustainable level. And the reason they're, uh, they, they would be in that boat is because it's the old expression, uh, when you owe the bank a hundred million and you can't pay it, you got a problem. But if you owe them a billion or two and you can't pay it, the banks have got a problem. And the banks, all of them, are so um, have so much debt outstanding, loans outstanding to this in industry because it's capital intensive. Um, the, they've got a major stake in it. So once they start curtailing it and bringing it in, there's loss. There's loss write-offs. And they haven't been reserving the kind of losses that they might have to take. So, but they're running on a runway, and something's going to have to give. Uh, something's going to have to give in here. But typically, you need to go through. I think we're agreeing. You need to go through that cleansing mechanism before you can start to have a shortage of supply, and then demand spikes it at some point. And and there will be a lot of money made. But there's been an awful lot of money lost. People trying to call this bottom here for about a year and a half. Right, and you're, you're correct about the banks. They're taking a page out of their 2008 playbook, right? The lend and pretend, you know, let's just ignore what's going on. And it really is shocking. If you ever talk to a, a banker from a major bank, national bank, it's ask them about their workout groups. It really is amazing that they have, if any, they'll have a skeleton crew to handle non-performing loans. And so when something like 2008 happens, 
when they pull every banker aside and put them on these teams and they can't even get their arms around what they have on, on hand, let alone try to fix things. And so the banks are really ill-equipped to deal with any kind of significant downturn in the economy or even a major sector like oil and gas. Uh, it's really quite shocking. And, and frankly, the banks can't, can't put up with this kind of strain. I mean, they already under an immense amount of strain. It's kind of like being a patient and your doctor, who would be the central banker, is injecting you with stimulants and depressants, whether it's QE and then negative interest rates. It's putting an immense amount of strain upon the banking system. And as any Austrian economist uh, would say, after a period of time when you keep increasing the money supply, ultimately one of two things happens. Either you receive incredible inflation within the economy or you have a banking crisis. And so maybe this could be the spark that really hurts the banking sector. Well, especially when you um, you look at the European banks, uh, who are major funders, um, and and their their leverage is so well. The banks are officially north of 52, 55 percent uh, leverage in the in the in European banks. Lehman went broke at what 33 to one, and uh, there's been a lot of studies say their leverage is even higher. So that's that's fine. They've been able to limp by, but th these all these loans are syndicated out. They're not just all on one bank's book. So they spread them out, and therefore they think they have less risk. The problem with that is it takes one smaller bank to go broke, and we have contagion as it rolls up, and and it, it always seems to start that way. We have one failure of a bank, and it could be because of a currency exchange. It could be a Hungarian bank who's on the wrong side of the euro, or some kind of peg breaks. Um, and, and that's usually where it comes out of nowhere in, in terms of a banking crisis. But I do agree with you. Um, I think the banks are the problem or are, are potentially seriously exposed here. And um, that, that is the problem. And the, uh, and the large en energy com companies, too, who have overextended themselves. We haven't seen those failures failed yet. And I would also argue a lot of the players that have our the Enron likes and the Glencores and these coins of corporation that are heavily into commodities, oil, and have really become nothing more than hedge funds trading these commodities and have overextended themselves. Any one of these areas could break and, and just begin to cascade. I don't want to make people nervous, but you usually see that when you get towards the bottom of the oil price. You don't usually get it, you know, at the bottom. You get it before as it finishes and then starts going back up. Comments on what I just said? I agree. And what I find particularly scary is if you look at all the industries, if you look at the economy as a whole, the one area that's the easiest way for the government to step in and enhance their financial repression, whether it's capital controls, et cetera, is with a banking crisis. And so this, this is the linchpin. It's really, it's the one reason that no one can deny because everyone, you know, anyone that's the mainstream can't deny it. You know, they just assume that, yes, the government needs to intervene with the banks, unknowing that the truth is if we just had a free banking system, everything would be fine. But it's because of this banking crisis, which could ensue, that's the greatest cause and the greatest reason for the government to step in and enhance their financial repression. Uh, the government will always step in and always uses a crisis for an opportunity for policy changes that are usually, I, I would argue, almost failed policies in many cases, but let's just leave it at that. Chris, where, where are the misconceptions here? Um, you know, we're giving our opinions, but in, in terms of the, where do you think the public is misunderstanding of what's going on in the energy market? Well, there's a whole host of them, and I'm not so much concerned about what the public views as a misconception as I am about the Federal Reserve. And so we discuss things like their misconception about the wealth effect that increased consumer spending actually helps an economy. I mean, I consider that false, and I think history's on my side, because if you look at any country which grew dramatically, 19th century America, post-World War II, Japan, South Korea, Germany, modern China until the last several years, all these things had two things in common. Very high levels of savings and decreasing government intervention within the marketplace. And so though, that's really the, the key to growth. It's a very simple formula. Um, so I think that's one misconception the Federal Reserve has. They have a misconception about deflation, that deflation is bad. Again, if you look at history, the U.S. itself experienced two 30-, 40-year periods where the price level fell in half. And it was one of the greatest times of growth within U.S. history. And so their concerns about deflation, I think, are largely false, if not let alone exaggerated. Uh, they have their misconception about um, 
inflation and its effect upon unemployment. Uh, they probably have great misconception about interest rates, too. The, the very idea that they're entertaining interest rates, negative interest rates, is absurd. And that could be the final nail in the coffin for banks leading to the crisis that we were discussing. I remember that we used to call oil black gold and, uh, you know, and negative interest rates um, that started in Japan, and we've seen them in a number of countries in Europe and, and the ECB, uh, we've seen a push in gold lately, physical gold, um, a breakout of some long-term trends. Um, some institutions saying they want to have some element uh, that's in cash because uh, with negative interest rates, almost you're preordained to see a cashless society forced in it to make sure that they they work. Does uh, so the, these? The, it seems that that's on the path that we're on, the road that we're on. How does that relate to oil? Do you think? Well, some people initially thought oil was an inflation hedge because if you looked at the 1970s, when inflation hit the U.S. significantly, gold went up significantly and so did oil. So reflexively, a lot of people think, well, that's, that's a good inflation hedge. I certainly do not think so. It's more of a play on worldwide supply and demand for oil, which is largely created by the world economic growth or, or lack thereof. Um, as far as what people should be doing, if they believe there's some kind of enhanced – or if they believe the oil markets will continue to create some kind of banking crisis down the road, certainly they want to look at being as liquid as possible, and not just currency, but also things like gold and pre you know other precious metals. I, I certainly agree with that's a a prudent uh, philosophy that they should have. Yeah, that's actually where I was leading is is with this situation. Then gold is a great insurance um, policy because it's outside the banking industry. It's an asset not tied to the banking industry. And right now, I would suggest the risk of, of this collateral con contagion that we could potentially see for not just the oil and the commodity problems, but sovereign debt and a number of, of other areas we haven't even talked about today. That um, And I'm not trying to be a gold proponent. I'm just trying to say you need to look at assets that are outside the banking system. And those are typically today what we call hard assets, uh, because they're not a liability, they're not somebody's liability. And uh, it's time to have, I think, some some kind of wealth management program in place that considers that. Uh, there's a lot of private investors that are doing that, but institutions, I don't see that movement at all. As a matter of fact, I think they just poo-poo it. Your observations on anything I just said? I completely agree. Um Gold should be considered as part of anyone's portfolio. They should absolutely consider gold or silver. Uh, it is far safer than a number of different currencies. Uh, you can store it in a number of different ways outside the banking system. And the reason it's so powerful, unfortunately, most people say it's because it has intrinsic value. And in reality, nothing has intrinsic value if there's no demand for it. It has great alternative value. It's not a piece of paper. There's only so, so many things you could do with a green piece of paper but gold and silver have a number of applications outside of being money. It just happens to be that historically money is their, their, the best application for that, that commodity. Uh, so I do encourage everybody to look at gold and silver as part of their portfolio. Um, and preferably you may want to keep it outside the banking system. I, I totally agree with that. Chris, Chris what does Winrock uh, Wealth Management do, uh, propose or recommend to clients that answers this question? Are there other, other, other solutions that are available? There are definitely other solutions. I mean, everyone kind of reflexively looks at precious metals as well as, as they should uh, because it is a very nice solution. Uh, another one, though, I would suggest would be farmland and for a completely different reason. If you own farmland in a country that's inflating their currency significantly, what you'll see, and we saw this in the 1970s, is that that particular commodity becomes very cheap for foreigners, right? If corn, if we inflate the... Uh, the U.S. dollar significantly, corn becomes from the U.S. becomes cheaper for a foreigner to buy. And when you have that, you have greater demand, and that increases the real price of corn domestically, which then increases farmland prices. And if you look back to the 1970s, you had the price level double, so it was up 100%. Well, you had farmland values go up about 300%. So I find it to be an excellent inflation hedge as well, and it pays a dividend, unlike precious metals typically. And so that's just another thing people should look at in addition to precious metals. So even though we're talking about oil today and the issues in the oil sector and the fallout and the misconceptions, 
the investors could be very could be busy taking advantage of this opportunity or at least finding insurance policies to protect them from possibilities coming out uh, coming here chris any um any last comments you'd like to make on on this our whole subject of inflation in energy uh well you know i would say that's it's just in, as far as energy goes it is amazing how perceptions have changed over the last 15 years where it's gone from lower prices being a good thing to a bad thing in both times i think the mainstream media and economists have looked at it as good or bad for the wrong reasons so maybe they had the right conclusion but for the wrong reasons I, I'd say the lower oil price, although all things being equal, it's it's good. There are some real dangers. There's a danger it could increase interest rates. There's a danger it could inflate, increase inflation levels, although um, for a different uh, reason than pe people typically cite. There's a danger that could induce a banking system crisis. So low oil prices have a real potential negative effect, but they also may lend themselves to an opportunity, as you mentioned, if people if prices go low enough. I think people should look at buying oil at a certain level. Are there any benchmarks that you're looking at, price points, tipping points that you've got in your mind, or Windrock sure. has on their on their charts? When we look at oil, first of all, we try to look at it on an inflation-adjusted basis because that's really you want to look at the real price of oil. And at certain levels, let's say it's I think about twenty-seven and a half. You're equating the levels that we're seeing in in the early part of this century. Uh, if it gets down to 20, you know, you're approaching levels that haven't been seen in multiple decades. And so I think those are nice price points for people to look at and use as a guide, but not necessarily as a, as a, as a bright line that they should make a decision at. Closing comments, Chris, before we break? Sure. Well, you know, Windrock, we, we spent a lot of time recently discussing oil and energy, and we're, we plan on coming out with some articles related to that. So I'd encourage everyone... Uh, to either check out our website or, of course, look at your website because we, we host a number of materials uh, with the Financial Repression Authority as well. well. Thank you for your time, Chris, and I uh, look forward to talking to you again, and I'm looking forward to speculating again on what happens with energy and farmland, by the way. Sounds good, Gordon. Thank you.